The International Space Station, for example, orbits just within the Earth's protective magnetic field. The magnetic field is what protects us, but outside the field, it gets really dangerous. There you can find galactic cosmic rays, solar particle events, and the Van Allen belts, which contain trapped space radiation. Space radiation comes from three major sources. One is there are radiation particles trapped around the Earth, and they're called the Van Allen radiation belts. The second source of radiation is from the sun. During times of intense solar activity, there can be solar storms and high fluxes of radiation. Protons in particular can reach Earth. The third source of radiation in space is called galactic cosmic radiation, and that's the one that's of most concern. However, galactic cosmic rays are a bigger problem to handle. These particles are highly energetic, and they come from all over the galaxy. They can tear right through metals, plastics, water, and cellular material. This ionizing radiation travels through living tissues, depositing energy that causes structural damage to DNA and alters many cellular processes. The galactic cosmic rays come from exploding stars that we call supernovas. So I think one of the common misconceptions about space radiation is just how different it is uh, from the type of radiation we have here on Earth. So here on Earth, when you think about sitting down in a dentist chair, they put uh, some kind of lead blanket on your chest to protect you, protect you against x-rays. In space, uh, it actually is very different. We don't want heavy materials because it makes the exposure worse. The primary means by which radiation affects cells is by damaging their DNA. You can get breaks in the strands in the double helix. You can knock bases out and the cell will make an attempt to repair that damage. Sometimes it's effective, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it'll actually get repaired, but in an error-prone fashion, so it's what we call misrepaired. So anything that sets into the genome in that way is a mutation, and in the accumulation of mutations can potentially lead to, to cancer and take a non-cancerous cell, a normal cell, and make it transformed into a cancerous one, so that's a big concern. The primary reason for that is in space we have particle radiation instead of electromagnetic radiation. Particle irradiation is, is basically everything on the periodic table, hydrogen all the way up through nickel and uranium, but moving at speeds that are close to the speed of light. It's very different than the amount of time that, say, a, a, a non-astronaut, just a regular uh, person that has nothing to do with space travel, gets over, say, a 70, 80-year lifespan from, say, some radon gas in the home or from uh, medical tests that are administered where you get a certain amount of dose from uh, CT scans or PET scans and uh, x-rays uh, through the course of, of life. So you're delivering a certain amount of radiation dose in a more compressed period of time than you would to the person that uh, has never been a space traveler and such. And that's one of the trickiest aspects to trying to determine radiation dose. The same amount of radiation dose delivered in a day is very different than that same dose delivered in three years. Even though, well, it's the same dose. It's not that simple and that has to be evaluated when you try to determine the, the potential risks of absorbing that kind of a dose. Astronauts, when they go on space travel uh, outside the Earth's magnetic field, will have to endure space weather. This space weather would include things like galactic cosmic rays, which are remnants from supernova, uh, and also solar storms, which include things like solar particle events and coronal mass ejections. But especially in 2016, with the advent of the galactic cosmic ray simulator, um, it's now much easier and more practical and realistic to deliver a more space-like exposure which involves changing those ion species and energies and dose rates on the fly because that's the situation that happens in space. A heavier particle has the potential to cause more biological damage than a lighter particle even at the exact same dose. Uh, analogy I can use is it's like the pound of feathers versus pound of lead argument. They're both a pound, but if I drop the pound of feathers on your foot, you might barely feel it. But if I drop the pound of lead on your foot, it might break a few toes. Goodness. For the same radiation dose, uh, what, what is the resulting biological outcome? Because different types of radiation have different relative abilities to cause damage and cause negative effects in living systems. In space, a lot of those things are very different. So we have a very complex radiation field that includes things like protons and all the particles on the periodic table of elements. 
they're coming in at energies that are approaching the speed of light and they're difficult to shield against and they're always there. So the concept of time really doesn't make sense because you can't reduce the exposure in space. You can't really reduce the distance at all because the radiation is everywhere. And shielding concepts for galactic cosmic rays are very difficult because of the energies involved. It's harmful to the body in a couple different ways. There's an in-flight risk from things like solar storms, and those really present acute radiation sickness type issues that would have to be dealt with operationally in real time. And then there's also long-term late effects like cancer, cardiovascular disease, impossible central nervous system effects. So thinking about the differences between Earth-based radiation and space radiation, we have a long history and, and a decent amount of data uh, about the biological consequences of uh, exposure to terrestrial radiation. Where we lack data and we have a, a large amount of uncertainty is the biological consequences of space radiation. Uh, and so really the next steps are, and, and the ongoing steps are to try to understand those exposures better and the biological consequences that follow them. Some of the reasons for that is that the health consequences following radiation exposure are very complex processes. It's difficult to quantify exactly how the radiation is interacting with tissue. And then it's even more complicated to try to quantify and determine what the long-term outcomes are going to be in terms of things like carcinogenesis, central nervous system effects, and detriment to the central nervous system. But the other, which we really don't have a firm handle on, is galactic cosmic rays. These are highly energetic particles that come from all over the galaxy towards the solar system and Earth. You can't shield against these. They're so energetic, they rip right through all metals, all plastic, all water, and all cellular material. And as they rip through these materials, little electrons and protons pull off of them, and uh, you end up getting a cascade effect of radiation throughout the materials. And sometimes going through certain materials causes a worse radiation environment for the crew that had gone through other materials. So we try to design the spacecraft out of materials that shield the crew from these, but also do not produce more hazardous particles as a function of being impacted with it. NASA is currently working on new ideas and concepts to protect humans from galactic cosmic rays. It, it's the main crucible testbed where we've been trying to grind out all the lessons that will eventually let us go to the moon. 